Floyd Street's Finest. I'm Jack Grossman. He's Jeff Greer. Thanks for tuning in a March Madness edition of Floyd Street's Finest. And the good news is, Jeff, all is quiet on the Western Front, right? No, nothing's <laughs> going on at all. This is a very slow moving time of year on every retrospect. Louisville's not in the tournament. There's nothing to talk about, right? Of course not. The coaching search has been absolutely haywire. We got players in the portal. And yes, on the back end, I would like to do, you know, some final four picks and stuff like that because you, you guys know me. I'm a sucker for this for this stuff um but jeff we do need to spend i feel like the bulk majority of our time here on the uh coaching search and the pivot that's kind of happened this morning and today to where it feels like the local side of things it's been a very big battle i feel like in some in some respects to where locally we've had drew dieter eric crawford rutherford a bunch of different people Say you know, Louisville's making these big offers for Scott Drew, eight, eight million, eight and a half million, I think is what Rutherford said last week. Crawford was somewhere in the six, seven million range. Say, you know, they're shooting their shot at Scott Drew. And I feel like more on the national side, it's been very tempered on that with Scott Drew. So I, so here's the first thing I want to ask you before we kind of get into like this shift to Dusty May and, and what what's going on there. Why has there been such a disconnect on a local and national front in terms of Scott Drew's interest in, in the Louisville job, the chances that he might end up taking it? But I would argue before today where it seems like things have shifted more the Dusty May. Yeah. Um, I, look, I think it, it's always going to be local versus national pretty much in any market um, when you've got people who know people. Um, so those, those guys you mentioned, uh, they know, people around town they know they know boosters they know uh people who maybe work in the in the in the athletics department um and and that's how this stuff happens the national guys are are i mean i i, I would the funny thing is is like i don't know that anybody is wrong uh if that makes any sense like i don't oh, I think agree that i don't think that anybody is it's just this is just my assessment of it. I'm I'm I as you know I've unplugged from a lot of stuff, but um, but no, I I just think a, a lot of it is dictated by agents, um, and then you know who you know in the business because coaches all talk, and um, they certainly are aware of of all of the jobs in the carousel and who may go where. There are certain big name coaches who have been around for a while who play a role in that kind of stuff um, and maybe help behind the scenes. I, I've heard some great stories over the years about, um, you know, Rick Pitino when he was in Louisville having a say in, in or not a say, but but being asked for his input uh, on certain job openings that come up uh, across the country. ADs reach out, uh, boosters reach out, all that stuff. And, that, and that's this business. So, um, you know, I, I, I think probably – the national guys are coming from a place of skepticism just in general that most coaches in the position that Scott Drew is in don't want to leave. I think it's hard for people um, to grasp or, or because we're so used to big name hires over the years or whoever the hot mid major coach is, and, and then maybe a couple of big name coaches moving from power conference to power conference or within uh conference. But Jack, the biggest thing is it seems like a lot of these guys are happy where they are. Um, and they're obviously getting paid handsomely. The money is really not going to be that big of a difference. So it's just a matter of, do you want to keep doing what you're doing at that school or elsewhere? And I think, you know, when you're getting your info from people who badly want something, and you're getting people uh, information from people who maybe are agents or connected in a different way, you might get a different tone in the delivery of it or or the way that it's brought up. That's just my uh, perspective on that. Right. And there's no doubt in my mind that Louisville has been shooting their shot for Scott Drew based off of everything we've heard. Mm -hmm. Just the question's always been, would that shot actually land? And would Baylor pony up the money on their end to, to make it competitive enough to to – for a guy that's been there for two decades, won a national championship there, literally just had a new arena and practice facility designed to his like liking yep. <laughs> there that opened just this year. That that's a lot to pull out of a guy. Yeah, but yeah, I think the sense of if Baylor wasn't going to play ball with him, maybe that would open up the Louisville job. And we haven't heard one way or another, yes or no, but I feel like with the shift locally. On on Tuesday, I almost said Wednesday. Today is actually Tuesday. Um, but but the shift we've seen here on Tuesday locally makes me sound like okay, maybe either Baylor ponied up the money or Scott Drew maybe 
you know, kind of, it, it seems to have cooled on that front, and it seems like the full court press is starting to be put on more Dusty May. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, um, that certainly seems the way the wind is blowing, but that's what a that's what the coaching carousel is. Right? You it's, never know. I mean, that's the wind. beautiful thing about it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. you never know. Um, so it, it is interesting. You know, the portal opened yesterday. Um, you've got teams that like don't have coaches like Louisville is getting, I uh, saw so they were enlisted for a kid from Drexel and you know, you're, you're like, well, who was making that phone call? I would assume it would be Josh. Josh and maybe Hurt, they've yeah. Kept, yeah. Maybe they've kept some staff on uh, just to help with the transition. I'm, I'm sure that that's uh, a common thing, but, um, but you know, I, 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 there was always going to be a, big fish that they would go and try to get. I always thought that that was going to be the case. I'm sure you did too, Jack, and most people out there. And and I think a lot of people thought after 2022 that, that it'd probably be Scott drew. Um, you know, I, I think there were a lot of Louisville fans holding out hope that Josh was going to try to go swing at Jay Wright and lure him out of uh, retirement, but Jay, boy, he looks great on television. Oh, he yes, he does. Happy. He he's was not, born I don't for think that. He's, <laughs> yeah. I don't think he's going anywhere. So, you know, I, I, I think you have a big fish that you go try to get. Um, and then you're always have a, a to be um, who you do, who you're really comfortable with and you like um, as, as someone who may be more quote unquote gettable. Um, and so it's been interesting listening to the jostling uh, in the fan base and, and from people who are around the program uh, who maybe have a little bit more um I don't want to say educated because that makes it sound like fans are, I don't want to say educated, and uneducated, but maybe have a better idea pulse of what's going on. Um, and, and hearing where all those people are arguing, you know, who fits here, who fits there, which, which coach is the best of the rest, that kind of stuff. I think it's been fascinating uh, to hear those conversations. Which I think, first of all, before we go any farther, that Dusty May would be a phenomenal hire for Louisville. If that is indeed who they end up going with, with, but but um, looking at can you tell me can you tell me why I not that I disagree yeah. I, I just would love to hear your thoughts on it. I mean, first of all, just watching his teams play, they're a lot of fun. I mean, obviously, he made the final four run last year, and I get it; they've had some issues this year. It hasn't been perfect, but you have to keep in mind they were in Conference USA last year. They were mm-hmm. the big fish. They step into the American. Yes, I get it. Memphis kind of collapsed, but you had Memphis there. You had UAB there, who ended up winning the conference title. South Florida went on that phenomenal run throughout the conference season, it's definitely a step up from where you were in Conference USA. So it's moving up a belt in conferences. It's moving up a step in competition. I'm not going to say it's the Big 12 or or the SEC by any means, but it's still much better night in, night out than what you're ha- having in Conference USA. And I thought they handled that really well. They were mm-hmm. able to handle being, you know, kind of – you know, the, the chasey instead of the doing the chasing, which mm-hmm. they had that target on their back all year long. They're getting everyone's best shot night in night out. More often than not, they're able to take those punches and win games. And there's also the aspect of the season ends last year. What's the first thing everyone said about FAU and why they didn't think Dusty May would even come back to that job for this year. It's well, they're going to lose all those players to the transfer portal. How is F how is little old FAU going to keep Elijah Martin, <laughs> John L Davis, Vlad, Golden, all those dudes. They kept the entire roster together. That is an incredibly hard thing yeah. to do at a place like Florida mm-hmm. Atlantic. And that is incredibly impressive. And do I think they were probably a tad overseeded for their resume at as an I forget if they're the eight or the nine, but they're in the eight-nine game. Yes, I do. I also think that's an absolute hose job on UConn's part that they have to draw that FAU yeah. team in the second round. I mean, there is also there, there is, there is a scenario where Boo Booey drops thirty five on on Thursday, and they end up winning. I mean, he's he's a phenomenal player. But Northwestern's down a couple stars. I do think FAU will be able to take care of business in that game. But that is as talented as a team you're going to face in an eight eight in a one eight matchup at around a thirty two. Yeah. And I'm picking yeah. UConn to go through that. But I wouldn't be shocked at all if Florida Atlantic won that game and went on another run. And you look at just what they did last year, how they've handled themselves this year. They did, you know, in one of the better games we saw all year long, they beat Arizona in double overtime. They played um, in what was basically a true road game out in Vegas. They played, you know, toe-to-toe with Illinois and MSG in the Jimmy V Classic. I, I like it. I think you'd be real. If you're not getting a guy like a Scott Drew or a Nate Oates, 
I, I think that's as good a guy to get. Plus, he's on the younger side. And I said this last week. Because, yes. or, or I yeah. said this last week. I know people are worried about the Indiana thing. If Indiana were to actually hire him, that means one, he'd be winning, which would make it appealing to Indiana. And two, people went nuts over the Jeff Goodman report last week on Field of 68 Daily about, about uh, you know, Louisville might not be able to get Scott Drew and all that. You know what the next bullet point under that was? Was maybe Dusty May doesn't want the pressure going back to his alma mater that he might be a better fit at Ohio State. Obviously, Ohio State just hired Jay Diebler as the interim. So, so you know, maybe I'm not saying one way or another he wants the job, but I don't know if it would be that slam dunk type of deal. But even if he did go to IU, that means he'd be winning and that would put you in a way better spot as a program than what you're in right now. Can I I'll just I'll just add on to your thoughts here because you know, I do think I think Dusty May is a good basketball coach. Um I I think one thing is I lived in, in Palm Beach County in West Palm Beach for three years. Boca Raton is in Palm Beach County. It's right on the border between Broward and Palm Beach County down in South Florida. And I went as Jack, you can appreciate this. You and I are cut from the same cloth. I went to a lot of FAU <laughs> basketball games. Are the facilities uh, like as lot. bad as everyone says they are? Um, I don't remember them being particularly impressive, uh, honestly, and I'm not trying to disparage FAU, but it, that program at the time, they were competitive. They had some decent players, but they were, I mean, they were just not, I think they were in the Sun Belt at that point. I think I could, don't quote me on that, um, but just it's it, 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 it's not a place for college basketball. I would go to bars in Palm Beach uh, county and remember palm beach you hear palm beach and you think of you know the breakers and these massive mansions and stuff that is like an island that nobody really goes to um <laughs> i'm talking west palm beach i'm talking uh, palm beach gardens these nice places boca raton um, but they're a very different part of the county so just to want to throw is that, that where del boca this. vista is yeah it's the made up del boca <laughs> vista yeah but um but that is not college basketball country, my friend. That is not even remotely. I mean, I used to have to ask to have March Madness games put on the TVs because they were so worried about rec football recruiting. Um, and, and that's when uh, UF and FSU were both pretty good and Miami was trying to figure things out. They still are. Um, and, and the NFL. And, and at the time, a little bit of the heat because uh, they were really good. But college basketball was an afterthought um there so you're dealing with a lethargic basketball community college basketball community or apathetic one or small one i guess is probably a fair point there's no recruiting base maybe you go down to miami and get some kids but it's not you know maybe go up to orlando but those you're competing with miami you're competing with ucf usf fsu and uf for florida kids you're that's that's tough um, and then on top of it, you know, again, it's just not a, it's not a basketball school. Now they've invested quite a bit and they've, they've spent some money and it's, it started to pay off obviously, but the fact that Dusty May has them in back-to-back -back tournaments, I think they've won 59 games over the last two years and is able to put together this schedule. I uh, brought it up while you were talking here. They beat Texas A&M on a neutral floor by seven. They beat Virginia Tech by 35 on a neutral floor, 34, excuse me. They beat Liberty, which is always a tough game uh, to play. They beat them by 25. They beat College of Charleston by 16. Charleston, I have picked to win in their opening round game against we, Alabama. We share that. That, 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 that is a that, good yeah. team. That is a good team. They're like 30 and three. And FAU beat them. They lost by nine to Illinois. Um, we mentioned the Arizona game. So, like, this is a good team. This is a good FAU team. It's not the, as good as it was last year. We know that. Um, the metrics have shown that maybe they're not as solid as they were last year, which is how they're in an 8-9 game. But um, Louisville fans have been aching to watch offense and an offensive flow. And, like, this is that's what Dusty May is going to do. Now, here's the difference. Dusty May is uh, – Maybe he'll surprise us. Um, I would highly recommend you go read the profile of him in The Athletic. I think it was C.J. Moore. Of course, it was C.J. C.J. always does a great job on these um, profiles, and he finds so many interesting things. But Dusty is not going to come in here and be the mayor of Louisville. He's not. That's just not going to be his personality. But dude is going to eat, sleep, and drink basketball. And uh, to see our friends uh, around town, I do Benny um, of Tiger uh, and dude is, is a, a guy that a basketball coach who has invested in your basketball team. So, um, you know, I, 
it may not be the Scott Drew. It may not be the Billy Donovan that people want. Um, but but Dusty May is a good basketball coach, and I think he, I think he's a good solid hire for this cycle. I think he's as as good as anyone that's been realistically thrown out there. There, I mean, he's you know he's this iteration of Shaka Smart is pretty much what he is. Is kind of how I would describe it. Yeah, the guy that made the final Probably, four yeah. in the mid major, and the question isn't if he ends up leaving; it's whether it's this year, or whenever it is. You feel like he'll eventually leave, right? Like, mm-hmm. like FAU's just not where you think he'll be for the long haul. And he's also, again, he's only 47 years old. Mm-hmm. Like, if, if he were to come and he were to hit, that's someone you could have for a long time. And yeah. that can bring the stability back to it that you don't have right now, <laughs> you know, where that you haven't had since Rick Pitino left, that Louisville became yeah. so accustomed to having. And I think even if he's not the quote unquote mayor of Louisville, as, as you're saying, you're going in and out there on the internet for a minute. You're, you're, you're really good right now. But, but just to kind of reiterate that Louisville fans want someone that will eat, sleep basketball. That that's, that yeah. that's someone 365 days a year, just be locked in on hoops that, you know, the football comparison was Jeff Brom saying that football is his hobby <laughs> and Louisville fans <laughs> loving that. But, but, but I think Louisville fans would very much resonate with that type of character, that type of attitude to it. I mean, they always got mad uh, for right, right or wrong. They always got mad at Chris Mack for being at that, at that, that lake in the summer. <laughs> Which was always funny. I don't know. I don't think you'd be getting that side of it with us. But that was always the one thing with Jay Wright. Also, Jay Wright, as phenomenal as a basketball coach as he was, he was. He, it sounded like he liked to unplug from time to time. So I was always like, you know, I don't know if he would really want the pressure cooker of Louisville. It, it, it seemed like a very good fit for Philly. So if it's not Dusty Main, it's not Scott Drew though. But let's do this. It sounds like Josh Shirts has kind of become the leading man at St. Louis and, and with, with Indiana state being, I would argue wrongly being left out of the NCAA tournament, that name's kind of cooled. Uh, you brought up college at Charleston. Yeah. Pat Kelsey's a name that's been thrown around a little bit. There has been great the last couple of years there. Um, Jerome Tang's a guy that's kind of cool. Nate Oates was always on the outside um, looking in anyways. And he got that contract extension. I would argue it's not a coincidence that that happened the same day the Michigan job opened. Um but I'll ask before we get to the other names, where does Mick Cronin fit into all this? Um, my perception is, is that it's not, that's not happening. That's just, again, I, this is my perception. I am, I don't want people to be like, oh, Jeff Greer said that I'd like, I am, I, this is, I'm outside looking in now at this point. Um, but you know, I, I, it doesn't sound like they're really, I know people have been jostling of, Oh, there's a way out of this buyout and blah, blah, blah. I'm not sure there is. And it's a big, big, big buyout. So same problem that Nate Oates has even, even what was it? 10 or 12 for him before they bumped it back up to, to 18. Yeah. Like that's a big buyout. And, you know, you've got to be, there are certain coaches who you're will, you know, your program is going to be willing to, to, to pay, um, and Scott Drew is one of them. Guy's got a national championship, um, but I just I don't. It doesn't seem like that is uh, from everything that I'm gathering from watching from the outside looking in. Doesn't seem like that is something. I the people that I would keep my eye on is um, definitely Pat Kelsey. Um, I think if 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 you don't end up with Drew or May, um, you know I, I think. You also maybe sit back and see how the tournament goes. You don't want to base your hire on that, but I tell you a guy who I, you know, I, I hope that people don't climb through the internet and, and, and come and smack me in the face. But if I'm Josh Hurd, I'm watching how Drake does, because I, I think Darian DeVries is a, he's a really good coach. Um, DeVries, DeVries, I've heard two different. I've heard of both ways too. <laughs> okay. um, but I think that dude can coach his butt off. Um, and the fact is, is that, you know, the Valley, I know the Valley isn't what people used to, to, to think of league. the Valley. It's a good league and they have been winning a lot for years. And we talk about, you know, I think the same thing you would get with, with all four of these guys between Dusty May, Josh Schertz, uh, Pat Kelsey and Darian DeVries, really good offensive coaches, really good, smart offensive minds. They run. I, I love when people say this, but they run good stuff. Um, interesting stuff. Uh, Jay Wright talks about it, talked about it, um, you know, on the selection show of like, this is an interesting team. And, you know, you, you want like in a situation like this, 
you want someone who, if you're not, again, if you're not going to get the Scott Drews and probably I would put Mick Cronin like a next tier down, but he's, he is a better basketball coach than Louisville fans give him credit for. for Absolutely. I think it's such a weird, Weird. Like, I think it's the Cincinnati thing. They just don't like the the Cincinnati thing. And then kind of the way he acts on the sidelines, I think, especially, you know, um, when there were rivalry games with Patino, but dude is a really good basketball coach. And, um, you know, you hear names like Jamie Dixon were, were tossed out a couple of weeks ago. Like those guys have all had success and they're, and they would be a high floor uh, type coaches. But when you're looking at the mid-major types, the, the those guys who are kind of the next wave of the you mentioned Shaka, the Shakas, the Archie Millers, uh, the Chris Max, all these guys who are in that wave of of coaches coming through. Greg Marshall was always seemingly mentioned um, in all of these jobs before things went south for him. But um, it, it's tough. You got to pick. You got to pick right. Um, you got to pick right about among those choices. But all of those guys have reputations as really sharp offensive minds. And, you know, the question is, can you go get a high level transfer? And, you know, Dusty May has proven that he can at at FAU. He went out and got some high level guys. Um, But those guys would 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 have to come in and figure out ways to bring in some big name players early uh, and and jolt that offense and figure out the offensive side of things. But I know you wanted to speak in a transfer. That's an easy segue for you. Um, let's talk about the transfers for a few minutes. Yes, and and just one last thing on that. Whoever the new coach is, I've said this many times before, but they're going to have to be very cognizant of the fan base is not going to be patient. Like, it, it's going to be, you know, even though they're new coming in, Louisville hasn't won an NCAA tournament game since 2017. They haven't made the field since 2019, and they haven't been to the second weekend since 2015. The mm. fan base – at especially with how the last few years, the Kenny Payne years and the last Chris Mack be easier have gone, they're going to want to win. They're going to want to win right away. So they're going, there's going to be a sense of urgency, need to be a sense of urgency for whoever that coach is to come and put a competitive product out there on the floor to at least be fighting for the NCAA tournament. The best month of the year is here which is why you need to know that we are now partnered with BetMGM. We'll be using BetMGM lines to make all of our picks, and we'll have special offers for the listeners and the viewers of the Field of 68 all through the NCAA tournament. If you haven't signed up for BetMGM yet, you can use the bonus code FIELD, and you will get up to a $1,500 first bet offer on your first wager with BetMGM, regardless of whether or not that bet hits here's the best part all you need to do is deposit and bet ten dollars of your hard-earned money this is how you make it work download the bet mgm app and sign up using the bonus code field deposit at least ten dollars and place your first wager on any game and you get up to fifteen hundred dollars in bonus bets regardless of the outcome of your bet just make sure you use that bonus code field when you sign up most importantly we do have some fun stuff coming for the conference tournaments and especially for the ncaa tournament bet insurance tokens college hoops odds boost and what i love the most a nice parlay boost for anything you could possibly imagine betting on in the ncaa tournament from odds and getting an at-large bid to final four futures to the highest seed to make to the sweet 16 i'm calling it right now bet mgm is the king of the prop bet for your March Madness needs. So go download the BetMGM app, use the code FIELD, and sign up today. And while I've got you a quick request, the best way to support the Field of 68 and our content you get for free is to engage with us. Rate and review the pod. Like and share the YouTube videos. Tell your friends about us. It helps in a world where the algorithm is king. And now, back to the show. But Mm -hmm. here's my piece on the transfer portal, Jeff. Uh, you, you've had in the last couple of days, Dennis Evans, JJ Trainer, Caleb Glenn, Curtis Williams enter the portal. I'm not overly worried about it for two reasons. Number one, you went eight and 24 <laughs> the last year. Like, it would it be nice to keep some Fair. of these players? Like, is there talent on the roster? Yes. But at the end of the day, you went eight and 24 with these players. So, uh, so if you if you're able to get some of them back, you, not whatever. Like, like the new coach will have to mold the roster how he pleases, and no matter how he wants to, that I'm good with that. Number two, and I would argue this is more important. Just because they're in the portal doesn't mean they can't come back. Bingo. And I and the example I'll use for this is 
after Indiana fired Archie Miller. Yes, I'm using an Indiana example. I'm an Indiana grad. I'm sorry. But after Indiana fired Jackie Ar- Hoosiers over yep, here. Yep. After Indiana <laughs> fired Archie Miller, IU had six players in the portal, and Trace Jackson Davis had declared for the NBA draft. They mm-hmm. hire Mike Woodson, and num- the number one thing for him was, one, he got Jackson Davis to come back out of the draft, mm-hmm. and two – he kept all six players that entered their name in the transfer report. Yep. It, it, it's a, that's huge. I, and, and I'm not saying that, you know, I Karan Davis also in the report, but I don't, I don't really count him on that, but, but <laughs> I know, but, but if you have end up with right now, you got four, technically five, but you end up with seven, eight players in the portal, the new coach can come back and re-recruit as many of them as he wants to. Maybe you get a few yep. of those guys back. Just because they're in the portal doesn't mean they can't come back. So I, I'm not exactly panicking, mainly for that second reason, but also the first one when it comes to, you know, oh, they have all these names in the portal. Yeah. No, I, and I, I agree. And, you know, I, I think ultimately, you know, um, there's time. There's time. There's, you know, a lot of these kids are looking to transfer up. Um, you know, you hear all the rumors of, oh, you know, there's a cold call and someone was offered 200 grand to come uh, to that school. You hear, you hear that stuff. And, and certainly, um, my group texts continue to be interesting, but like, there's going to be kids available. And I know, you know, for fans, like you said, you know, it, it, the familiarity helps you got a 31 game sample or 32 game sample with a lot of these guys. And I, I mean, I know there are injuries and stuff or multi-year samples in the case of like a JJ trainer, guys like that. But you also have to remember, you know, JJ Trainer and Mike James have experienced a lot of basketball coaches uh, in their time at Louisville. Um, you know, the guys who came in this year played through a season of of it was it was pretty dire. Um, and so y- you want to try to keep those guys just because you know them. Um, and I think that there's lots of time for them to retain them. But also remember that a lot of the guys who are entering the portal want to want to move up. Um, and tournament teams are are. Are they recruiting? Of course they are. That's like the 98% of the work that these coaching staffs do. But, um, you know, you, they're, they're not going to be able to get them on campus and stuff like as, as frequently um, to be able to do visits and, and do all of that stuff. So there is a little bit of time and, and Louisville should be, you would think with a good hire and a quick coaching staff piece together, they should be able to be competitive. Uh, to go out and get some guys and, and yeah, maybe they keep a couple of them too. And, you know, the coaching staff, it's all about that preparation and that presentation. How do you talk through to a kid and say, Hey, if you come back, these are the ways I can help you get better. These are the ways that I think this team can be better. Um, but I'll tell you what, Jack, I'm going to throw this out there. I, because, you know, I have limited appearances now on, on, on the old <laughs> podcast um, I'm really excited. I was I was bummed, but I expected it that that my Pitt Panthers were not going to make the tournament. Um, but I'm going to tell you right now, uh, if if they're able to keep that core, I know Blake Henson will be moving on, but if they're able to keep that core, and you get Low and Carrington in the back court, you get the Graham twins, you get Federico, Federico, Ishmael Leggett. Let's see if he comes back. Give me give me a wing in the transfer portal, and I think Pitt is a preseason top twenty five team. I like it. I like it. First of all, Federico. I am jacked up. I'm going to watch every game next year. Every game. <laughs> Federico Federico is one of the better names in college basketball. Oh, it's, it yeah, may be the it's best. It's so yeah. good. It's so good. I like Chucky Hepburn, too. That's Chuck, really... uh, hey, he's playing good ball now, too. Yeah. He's, he's, he uh, looked pissed at the, yeah. on the selection Sunday. Did you see him? <laughs> he, he was did. like not reacting to anything. It was great. I mean, they just lost the Big Ten title game like 20 minutes prior. So it makes sense, but... But I mean that that's a big revelation for Wisconsin because he's a dude that they expected to carry a lot more of the scoring load this year, and he hasn't taken that step for the most part. I mean, AJ Stewart's really filled in nicely, but but to see him come on in the Purdue game and against Illinois, uh, that could be good for Wisconsin. They drew a really really rough one with uh, James Madison though, and that yeah I'm, uh, yeah. I've already I think I have JMU winning that game. I think I have flipped back and forth about about four times already. On, oh no, on, on Wisconsin. That one. <laughs> I have Wisconsin. Well, let the, what are your picks, Jack? Uh, so, so I have I have five bold predictions that I need you to tell Let's me if I'm it. crazy. I or love not. it. Okay. All right. Number one, I have Mississippi State beating North Carolina and going to the Elite Eight. Number two, oh, you're going to say all yeah, five. Oh, yeah, yeah I'll, 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 go, five I'll roll through all five. Um, number two, I got 
I I got both. I got a Grand Canyon Charleston matchup and Grand Canyon in the Sweet Sixteen. Okay. Number three, I got uh-huh. I got Florida making an Elite Eight run and upsetting Kentucky in the Sweet Sixteen. Wow. Okay. I like I like that Florida team. Okay. Or yeah, I'm, I'm trying to remember all these. They kicked my quick. Panthers' ass this year. That was that was brutal. Yeah, they're playing. They're playing really good ball right now. All right. Um, I have BYU over Illinois and Iowa State. Okay. And then I right now I have Houston in the final four, but I have no confidence in that because mm-hmm. of their injuries on the front line. Mm-hmm. But I'm just I, I don't know if I trust I, I can't trust Kentucky to win four games in a row the way they defend. Plus, that Florida's played them really well twice already. Marquette has the cold like injury stuff to where they, they I thought they fought pretty and admirably. I, I butchered that word so terribly. <laughs> the last the last few they, it was very admirable how they played the last few weeks without Kolek. But I just I, I can't trust them to it, to face the firepower of one, you know, a Kentucky and a sweet 16 game with him missing a month or two, being able to handle Houston's pressure on mm-hmm. that. So I don't know if I trust them. And and three, I have them losing to Florida anyways, in the way Florida's playing mm. right now. Yeah. Now, um, and then four, or I guess the fifth one would be, I'm tempted, I don't have it in my bracket right now, but I'm very tempted to have Nebraska or A&M beating Houston along the same wow. lines. Wow, okay, okay, interesting. Okay, what's your final four? Right now, I have three one seeds and a two seed, which I absolutely hate. Because that's never going to happen. But I have mm-hmm. UConn, Houston, Purdue, and and Arizona. Okay. Okay. So so that's I I that I, I think that might be part of my reason is I'm very hesitant to put three one seeds in the final four. And I'm looking that's at fair. Houston as they're banged up. They just got smoked by Iowa State, and and maybe you know the injuries on the front lines really going to impact how they defend. But I think Purdue Purdue's ever going to make it to the Final Four. This is going to be the year. First of all, this is the best team they've had, which you know makes sense. And second of all, yeah, they 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 got an absolute gift of a draw. Like I think Utah State and and TCU are both good teams, but they're not good enough to beat Purdue in the second round. They got Gonzaga as their five seed, who I thought should have been like an eight or a nine. I, I think that I think they were one of the most overseeded teams I've ever seen in this event. That I like, <laughs> like, all, like they beat Kentucky and St. Mary's on the roads. I road. I get that. That's their entire resume. They haven't done anything. Yeah. And, and just yeah. the love the the West Coast Conference has been a very good league the last few years, but they lost BYU this year, and St. Mary's did absolutely nothing in the non conference. I do not understand how both those teams got five seeds. It's ridiculous to me. I, I thought the Mountain West really got screwed, and of course, the I thought Houston. they did too. I know, I know everybody yeah. thinks that. And look, you know, I I know that I'm biased. I, I I just I don't see. And again, the eye test is is not a thing. And yeah. you know, Pitt's non conference strength of schedule ended up being in the 300s, and that is ultimately what did them in. But I did not. I don't see how you could watch St. John's, Seton Hall, Pitt, any of those teams play in the last few weeks and be like, these aren't good enough to these these teams do not belong in the tournament and i know it's all about resume and all that stuff but i'm sorry that you you watch those teams and 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 again i am as i am as committee i'm such a committee guy i love (laughs) the numbers i i love the quad the quadrants i I love diving into that stuff i'm on warren nolan it's it's my most visited website on my iphone on my safari is (laughs) warrennolan.com Um, Mine is bracketologist.com, which is the exact yeah, same thing yeah. as, as Warren Nolan. <laughs> yeah, number two is bracket matrix, you know, and and so I'm looking at at all this stuff and and I get it. I get that the that the resumes, I think Pitt probably had less of an argument than than St. John's and and probably Seton Hall, but like those teams should have been in the tournament and the Mountain West got screwed. I yeah. you don't you should not Boise State should not be playing in a play-in game. Boise State should be playing uh, in an eight, nine game, but anyway, all right, let me give you my picks here. So one, I don't think you're crazy on Mississippi state. Um, you watch a lot of big 10. And I think as a result, you, uh, are probably going to laugh at, at, at my thought here, but it, I, I'm, I have the upset too, but I have it being Michigan state. And here, the here's, reason... here's my thing. I like, well, both hold on. Of them. Sorry to hold on. Hold on. I like, I like you. I like you. You know me. I'm, I'm a jabber mouth. <laughs> I, I, give me, let me give you my picks. Um, I, I, 
it's it's Izzo. And I know it's not, I know that he is not uh that that maybe he's people have kind of been critical of him lately and and that's fine. I I I'm trying to pick a one seed uh early to go out, and I was debating between Purdue and um Purdue and, and UNC and UNC has two power conference teams that metrically are are highly rated. And that is a problem. I think Tennessee may have the same issue with Texas. If Texas gets through that first round, I think Tennessee is going to have their hands full with a team that is a power conference team that has good metrics. The Rick Barnes uh, Bowl. Yeah, the Rick Barnes Bowl. Um, and then the the other ones that I really um, I really like Creighton. I've got Creighton in my final four, actually. Um, and I don't trust Marquette because of the injury. I also, um, I, I think I have Marquette in the elite eight, but I just don't think that they can, I don't think they're a final four team, but here's, here's the ones that I've dinged. And, and maybe this is, um, my life as a, as a, a pit alum, but I don't trust anyone who gets hot during championship week and wins the conference tournament. So I've got Moorhead state beating Illinois. Okay. All Which right. is a hugely dangerous would, pick. Yeah. Illinois is a lot of talent. They look really freaking good last week. Um, I also have Washington State um, or Crate or Drake. I, I I like Drake. I keep saying I have him in my Elite Eight. Um, I don't know if I'm ready to pull the trigger on that though. So the winner of Washington State Drake, I have winning, uh, beating Iowa State in the second round. Those are the two hot uh, conference tournament winners. Um, I've got Charleston beating Alabama. Um, so I, I've taken a risk on some of these and I just don't know uh, how confident I am uh, in any of them. But the other one that I want to throw out there, Jack, is every year there's been a first four team who gets to the Sweet 16. So I've got Boise State as my Sweet 16 team, even though I know the Mountain West has not historically uh, in the last few years had a great time in the NCAA tournament. Fortunately for me, if Colorado does it, I get credit for the same thing yeah. in my bracket. So I don't, at least in the ones I'm picking, but our final four is pretty similar. Um, I've got Purdue and Creighton, um, or excuse me, Houston and Creighton and, um, and UConn and Arizona. So close. I think that make that gets us three of the four same. And then I've got UConn over Houston. Um, I know it's hard to repeat. I, I actually have really liked Purdue all year. I've really liked Tennessee and honestly, I really like UNC, so I feel weird picking against them um, early like that. But I think the biggest thing for me is, like, Houston has – I know they got rocked last week, but there have been so many games against high-level opponents this year where Houston just kicked their ass. Oh, yeah. And I know they're not healthy, um, you know, all this stuff, but uh, but at the end of the day, um, I mean, they've just kicked some ass this year. So I, I think they're – I think those two in Purdue are the best teams in the country. Um, but I just, I, I'm kind of in my, I, I feel bad. Cause I, and I know you're an IU guy. Yeah. I'm rooting for Purdue. Like I want Purdue to win it all because I like teams that get this moniker of they always choke. Villanova used to get that Florida used to get it. Then they went on their little runs. Uh, Virginia, of course, did it. And I know Louisville fans is probably painful to hear that. It's like, Oh, I thought it was kind of nice that they finally won a title. Um, there, being... there is, there is some irony though. Like Virginia loses in 2018, then mm -hmm. in 2019 they get put in a region with. When you think of you know the quote unquote choke artists of March, they get put in a region of Tony Bennett, Greg Barnes, Matt Painter, Fran McCaffrey. <laughs> then it, Purdue goes out, loses to a 16 last year, and this year mm -hmm. who's in their region? Mm -hmm. Greg Barnes, Tony Bennett, and Texas, who no matter who the coach is, always chokes. I love it. it. Feels like. I love it. So it is kind of kind of funny how that happens. Yeah, I love it. Well, I will. Um, it, it's funny because I before the bracket was revealed, um, I and I have proof of this. I have receipts if you need it somewhere. <laughs> um, but I, I I had been saying two coaches who I think would be really interesting hires for Louisville. If it got to the, to, to that point where they were looking at these or Kyle Smith and Darian DeVries and are playing each other in the first round yeah. uh, with, with Washington state and, and Drake. And, um, but I, I like, I, I, I really liked them before the tournament started. I'm disappointed that they're playing each other. So that's probably the game that I've struggled with the most out of every, out of every pick. Yeah. I've struggled. I, I that, that, 
second round Carolina game is is really struggling. Yeah, for me. because because yeah. I feel like you got to pick one somewhere. I think that's the best chance. Um, Michigan State, I love Izzo. Obviously, I wouldn't be stunned at all if he was going to make the run. But I look at Michigan State's front line; it's so mm-hmm. so so bad. And yeah, I look at I and I look and I look at Tolu Smith. And I think Tolu Smith can just eat them alive on the front line. Tyson Walker's phenomenal. He hasn't gotten enough help this year, but I think Josh Hubbard can, can if not outplay him, I think he can have like a push with Tyson Walker no. on the perimeter to where I think Tolu Smith would be the difference of that one. But do we really think either one of those two teams can beat North Carolina in Charlotte? I don't know. I, that's why that, that's that's the big. That's my question. big hang. In fact, up. I may end up changing my bracket. I still have time. I have two more days. I, yeah. I'm, I'm waffling on a few of these picks just listening to you talk. So, <laughs> but yeah. I'm on. I, I got I got UConn over Purdue. Um, I like Creighton a lot. Also, I have them in my Elite Eight. But Kalkbrenner, that'd be a heck of a match. That'd be a phenomenal match. The oh two things gosh. I look at is Kalkbrenner, probably the best post defender in the country, going up against Edie. Creighton doesn't foul against Purdue, who fouls literally everyone out. I think mm-hmm. would be fascinating. What it comes down to is how do you beat Purdue on the offensive end? Pick and roll, killing Edie in that drop coverage and mid-range jump shots. If they still had Ryan Nemhard on that team and he wasn't at Gonzaga, I, I would pick Craig in a heartbeat. But Trey Alexander can do it some, but I just don't know if they have the personnel to be able to to totally take advantage of that the way, you know, like Northwestern with Boo Booey has, for example, like Wisconsin did with You just like Storch saying Boo Booey. <laughs> All right, so I I know you got to go because you have a, a real life and you have to go do stuff. Um, we're uh, let me ask you this: in yeah. their region, UConn has basically been sort of this unquestioned. They got uh, screwed for, for good with reason. Their draw. They're yeah. incredible. Who? Which team out of this group, out of this this region, which team will give them the most trouble? I I I, I look at two. I look at FAU and Auburn. FAU Which is crazy that yeah. right the second round in Sweet 16. Yeah, because I look at it and I say FAU has so much talent. They've been there before and they kind of played with their food a little bit in the American, I feel like. <laughs> but if they flip that switch, they're as good as anyone. And we just talked about Purdue with <laughs> taking advantage of that drop coverage. You put Kling in, in that drop coverage, Samson Johnson, that or James, that drop coverage, and John L. Davis, Elijah Martin can eat. They they can have they can catch fire now. I don't know if they can defend well enough to 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 beat UConn and play and do it for a full forty minutes. But I would be shocked at all if they won that game, and that scares me because I have UConn winning the championship. The other one I look I at is Auburn. Their their defensive intensity, defensive pressure is so 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 good. If they're hitting their shots, you know I think they're the only team like top five above offensive and defensive efficiency. If they're not top five, yeah. they're somewhere like top seven and eight. They're very balanced. They're very deep. They'll play aggressive. It, I think that, and then be sometimes really, they just really get really their asses team. kicked. Yeah, like that. That's yeah. so interesting with them. And we have a uh, one of my colleagues here is an Auburn grad. He watches pretty much every Auburn hoops game and definitely football. And he'll just come in the next day, like, oh, they they destroyed so and so. He's like, yeah, they, you know, they look pretty good. And then like two weeks later, be like, well, we lost by twenty. <laughs> and I, I, that's it's fascinating, but. But Bruce Pearl is is that's a heck of a matchup. Uh, yep. if and, and if you remember point. the one time he made the Final Four, it was a similar type spot facing North Carolina with Kobe White, Luke May, and all those dudes. Mm-hmm. Really, I, I, the team I thought was going to win the national championship that yeah. year, phenomenal team out of a beast of an ACC, and they whooped him by like twenty five that Sweet Sixteen game. Yeah. So yeah. I would not be stunned at all. And then I like BYU um, also to come out of the bottom half of that bracket, which I think you can handle BYU, but Illinois, yeah. they have really good individual defenders, but for whatever reason, they don't defend well as a team, which is very weird. And you look at the two games they played Iowa State, that ends up being the Sweet 16 matchup. BYU whooped them in, in the game in Utah, and they led for about 35 minutes in, in, in Hilton Coliseum. So I think I like that matchup for them to get to the lead eight. I have to go because for full disclosure, it's 2.23 p.m., and I have to be at work by 2.30. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, hey, it's only about a seven-minute drive, so it's going to cut it close. All right, get your booty um, in the car, so, buddy. Yeah, so I'm going to go. I, I wish we had more time. We'll, we'll do something again soon here on Floyd Street's Finest. Jeff, always, always appreciate the time, buddy. We'll catch up again soon. Enjoy the March Madness, the term.